it's not unheard of for museums to try to do this, to try to sell works from the collection in order to raise money for non-art related purposes, you know, not, not to buy other artworks and not to preserve. What's unusual about this, and which really makes it to my mind the most egregious case I've ever seen of this kind of activity, is the sheer volume of works that are being sold, the quantity and the quality. They want to sell 40 works. Um, and they selected them in a very bizarre way. They had Sotheby's and Christie's appraise several hundred works from their collection, and then they picked the top 40 by price, not the works that they really found expendable. Um, the criterion was solely to raise as much money as possible, and that meant getting rid of pretty much the cream of the collection. Price and quality correlate fairly closely, and I've never seen any museum do that before. Um, there was a lack of transparency. I have seen that before, but uh, that was another problem with the sale. Mm -hmm. Then maybe, yeah, let's talk more about like from the ethical standpoint, because mm -hmm. we know that like probably there are some ethical guidelines that museums should have like to follow. Absolutely. Art, they had trouble in raising the money that they felt they needed, not just to keep the museum going, but they want to do this grand new vision plan. Um, and they couldn't find the money for it. Well, the Metropolitan Museum couldn't find the money for its expansion that it's planning to do, um, but it didn't sell the Rembrandts. That's not the way to do it. What you do is you pause, you postpone, you make some cuts. I mean, the Met laid off some people, and you just wait until you can get the consensus and the donor support that you need. Um, that's the way it should be done. That's not what they chose to do. They took the quick expedient path because Basically, they were um, not willing to follow pro proper procedures. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk like a little bit about like Rockwell's painting? Like, have you well, you know, <laughs> Rockwell's not necessarily my you know in my list of top ten artists, <laughs> but I have to tell you that when I went to the auction preview, they had a press preview last Friday. I was wowed by those two paintings. I mean, they were extraordinary in their quality, in their impact. Um, Rockwell was a poet of the a visual poet of the common man. He captured life in that area. The, the most expensive work, which is Shuffleton's barber shop, is um, very moving and very contemplative. It shows the barber shop after hours with several old men meeting in the back room. The back room is glowing with a golden light, playing chamber. This is not a barber shop quartet. This is a chamber music group at the back of the barber shop. It's the intersection of culture with small town life. It's exactly what the Berkshire Museum is supposed to be about. I mean, if there was ever a painting that belonged in that museum, that's the one. The other one, uh, the blacksmith shop, which is also being sold, is a very different kind of painting, but it's a tour de force of physiognomy. I mean, he has all different characters there, with all kinds of animated expressions. Um, it's a sort of storytelling of a um, competition between blacksmiths to see who could do the, the, the young guy, the young upstart, and the older guy. And of course, the older guy is winning. Um, and that's what that painting is about. Again, it's small town life. These are real people that he photographed in the area where he lived and then made paintings from the photographs. That's how he worked. Uh, it, these are very locally important works, mm -hmm. and also nationally, of course. Mm -hmm. Then why do you think, um, like, what is going to be a big loss for, for the art community? Well, the big loss will extend beyond those paintings to something much bigger. Um, this, as you correctly noted, these are not isolated instances. There are other museums that are similarly financially strapped and would be very tempted to do this sort of thing. And if the Berkshire Museum gets away with it, which it looks like it's going to, unless there's a very last minute intervention by the Attorney General that the judge is actually willing to hear, and it doesn't look that way, unless that happens, um, this sets a precedent, a very bad precedent, for other museums to do the same thing. And, you know, the AAMD be damned. They're just going to do it, and they'll manage. It's going to be the attitude of some museums. So what's needed, really, is, a, is legislation or regulations. There's no way to stop this unless there's actual government control over these kinds of deaccessions. Mm -hmm. I'll maybe talk a little bit more about um, what do you think could be a possible solution. Well, uh, New York State actually enacted a possible, there were regulations in New York State, they were enacted in 2011, that actually say that you can own, that museums can only sell works for certain specified purposes, which is to replenish the collection or care of the collection. Um, and it's, you know, it basically tracks the language of the associations. Um, so that's a great start, and other 
states should emulate that, and perhaps the Attorney General of Massachusetts should get behind an effort of that sort, um, because you, they, it's not, it probably is not illegal, unfortunately, what the Berkshire Museum did, um, unless somebody actually stipulated in writing explicitly that the works they were donated could not be sold. Uh, it's probably, it is unethical, but it's probably not illegal, and it pains me to say that. <laughs> But um, I think the judge may have been right in that regard. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, like any additional steps that like people in our community like could take, right, in order to prevent this rape from happening again. Well, public like, opinion, yeah. the force of public opinion could be a more, and, and there were groups of protesters who rallied, who you know protested in front of the museum, wrote letters to the uh, paper, and so on. So yeah, if there were an overwhelming force of public opinion deploring this from you know this occurrence, that could have some effect. But some some of these directors may just be hell bent on doing this and figure they'll worry about it later, and eventually people will forget. The one thing we haven't touched on yet is the role of the auction house in all this. Um, Sotheby's is an enabler. It's not Sotheby's role to decide who should sell what and whether it's appropriate. It's their role to provide a marketplace, granted. But they're doing something that has been condemned by basically the mu whole museum field. Uh, museums are both sellers and buyers at auction, and they may have, there may be, first of all, there may be a cloud over this sale. There's a question as to whether museums will buy works that have been tainted by this history, um, and there may be a, a you know a cloud over uh, in terms of bidding and prices for this. I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, certainly, when the Detroit Museum, the Detroit Institute, thought that it might have to sell works because it was going to be told to do so by the um, by the government because of the um, creditors in the bankruptcy of Detroit. Uh, the Detroit, the uh, curators, I heard them say, there's no museum who's going to touch these works because these should not be sold. And I think that could be a problem. And Sotheby's, as well as the museum, may have a certain reputation problem for doing this, even though, again, they're not doing anything that's illegal. They're, they're fulfilling a certain function, but there's an ethical equation that also has to be made on this.